E Unibus Plurum, Television and U.S. Fiction, David Foster Wallace, June 22, 1993, narrated by Ethan DeLule, June 22, 2023. Act Natural. Fiction writers as a species tend to be oglers. They tend to lurk and to stare. The minute fiction writers stop moving, they start lurking and stare. They are born watchers. They are viewers. They are the ones on the subway about whose nonchalant stare there is something creepy, somehow. Almost predatory. This is because human situations are writers' food. Fiction writers watch other humans, sort of the way gapers slow down for car wrecks. They covet a vision of themselves as witnesses. But fiction writers as a species also tend to be terribly self-conscious, even by U.S. standards. Devoting lots of productive time to studying closely how people come across to them, fiction writers also spend lots of less productive time wondering nervously how they come across to other people. How they appear, how they seem, whether their shirt tail might be hanging out their fly, whether there's maybe lipstick on their teeth, whether the people they're ogling can maybe size them up as somehow creepy, lurkers, and starers. The result is that a surprising majority of fiction writers, born watchers, tend to dislike being objects of people's attention, being watched. The exceptions to this rule, Mailer, McInerney, Yanovitz, create the misleading impression that lots of belles lettres types like people's attention. Most don't. The few who like attention just naturally get more attention. The rest of us get less, and ogle. Most of the fiction writers I know are Americans under 40. I don't know whether fiction writers under 40 watch more television than other American species. Statisticians report that television is watched over six hours a day in the average American household. I don't know any fiction writers who live in average American households. I suspect Louise Erdrich might. Actually, I have never seen an average American household, except on TV. So right away, you can see a couple of things that look potentially great for U.S. fiction writers about U.S. television. First, television does a lot of our predatory human research for us. American human beings are a slippery and protean bunch in real life, as hard to get any kind of univocal handle on as a literary territory that's gone from Darwinianly naturalistic to cybernetically post-postmodern in 80 years. But television comes equipped with just such a syncretic handle. If we want to know what American normality is, what Americans want to regard as normal, we can trust television. For television's whole raison is reflecting what people want to see. It's a mirror. Not the Stentalian mirror reflecting the blue sky and mud puddle. More like the overlit bathroom mirror before which the teenager monitors his biceps and determines his better profile. This kind of window on nervous American self-perception is just invaluable, fiction-wise, and writers can have faith in television. There is a lot of money at stake, after all, and television retains the best demographers applied social science has to offer, and these researchers can determine precisely what Americans in 1990 are, want, see, what we as audience want to see ourselves as. Television from the surface on down, is about desire. Fictionally speaking, desire is the sugar in human food. The second great thing is that television looks to be an absolute godsend for a human subspecies that loves to watch people but hates to be watched itself. For the television screen affords access only one way, a psychic ball check valve. We can see them, they can't see us. We can relax, unobserved, as we ogle. I happen to believe this is why television also appeals so much to lonely people. To voluntary shut-ins. Every lonely human I know watches way more than the average U.S. six hours a day. The lonely, like the fictional, love one-way watching. For lonely people are usually lonely not because of hideous deformity or odor or obnoxiousness. In fact, there exist today social and support groups for persons with precisely these features. Lonely people tend rather to be lonely because they decline to bear the emotional costs associated with being around other humans. 
They are allergic to people. People affect them too strongly. Let's call the average U.S. lonely person Joe Briefcase. Joe Briefcase just loathes the strain of self-consciousness, which so oddly seems to appear only when other real human beings are around, staring, their human sense antenna a bristle. Joe B. fears how he might appear to watchers. He sits out the stressful U.S. game of appearance poker. But lonely people, home, alone, still crave sights and scenes, hence television. Joe can stare at them, on the screen. They remain blind to Joe. It's almost like voyeurism. I happen to know lonely people who regard television as a veritable deus ex machina for voyeurs. And a lot of the criticism, the really rabid criticism less leveled than sprayed at networks, advertisers, and audience alike, has to do with the charge that television has turned us into a nation of sweaty, slack-jawed voyeurs. This charge turns out to be untrue, but for weird reasons. What classic voyeurism is, is espial. Watching people who don't know you're there as they go about the mundane but erotically charged little businesses of private life. It's interesting that so much classic voyeurism involves media of framed glass windows, telescopes, etc. Maybe the framed glass is why the analogy to television is so tempting. But TV watching is a different animal from peeping tourism. Because the people we are watching through TV's framed glass screen are not really ignorant of the fact that somebody's watching them. In fact, a whole lot of somebodies. In fact, the people on television know that it is in virtue of this truly huge crowd of ogling somebodies that they are on the screen, engaging in broad, non-mundane gestures at all. Television does not afford true espial because television is performance, spectacle, which, by definition, requires watchers. We're not voyeurs here at all. We're just viewers. We are the audience, megametrically many, though most often we watch alone. E unibus plurum. One reason fiction writers seem creepy in person is that by vocation, they really are voyeurs. They need that straightforward visual theft of watching somebody without his getting to prepare a speciable, watchable self, the only real illusion in Espiel is suffered by the voyee, who doesn't know he's giving off images and impressions. A problem with so many of us fiction writers under 40 using television as a substitute for true Espiel, however, is that TV voyeurism involves a whole gorgeous orgy of illusions for the pseudo-spy when we watch. Illusion 1 is that we're voyeurs here at all, the voyees behind the screen's glass are only pretending ignorance. They know perfectly well we're out there. And that we're there is also very much on the minds of those behind the second layer of glass, the lenses and monitors via which technicians and arrangers apply no small ingenuity to hurl the visible images at us. What we see is far from stolen, it's preferred, illusion two. And illusion three, what we're seeing through the framed pane isn't people in real situations that do or even could go on without consciousness of audience. What young writers are scanning for data on some reality to fictionalize is already composed of fictional characters in highly ritualized narratives. Plus, four, we're not really even seeing characters at all. It's not Major Frank Burns, pathetic self-important putz from Fort Wayne, Indiana. It's Larry Linville, of Ojai, California, actors stoic enough to endure thousands of letters, still coming in, even in syndication, from pseudo-voyeurs mistakenly berating him for being a putz. And if five isn't too out there for you, it's ultimately, of course, not even actors were espying, not even people. It's EM-propelled analog waves and ionized streams and rear-screen chemical reactions throwing off phosphines in grids of dots not much more lifelike than Surratt's own impressionistic statements on perceptual illusion. Good lord. And six, the dots are coming out of our furniture. All we're spying on is our own furniture, and our very own chairs and lamps and book spines sit visible but unseen at our gaze's frame as we contemplate Korea, or are taken to live in Amman, Jordan, or regard the plusher chairs and classier spines of the Huxtable home as illusory cues that this is some domestic interior whose membrane we have, slyly, unnoticed, violated. Seven and eight, and illusions ad infinitum. 
Not that realities about actors and phosphines and furniture are unknown to us. We simply choose to ignore them, for six hours a day. They are part of the belief we suspend. But we are asked to hoist such a heavy load aloft. Illusions of voyeurism and privileged access require real complicity from viewers. How can we be made so willingly to acquiesce for hours daily to the illusion that the people on TV don't know they're being looked at, to the fantasy that we are transcending privacy and feeding on unself-conscious human activity? There might be lots of reasons why these unrealities are so swallowable, but a big one is that the performers behind the two layers of glass are, varying degrees of thespian talent aside, absolute geniuses at seeming unwatched. Now, seeming unwatched in front of a TV camera is a genuine art. Take a look at how civilians act when a TV camera is pointed at them. They simply spaz out, or else go all rigor mortis. Even PR people and politicians are, camera-wise, civilians. And we love to laugh at how stiff and false non-professionals appear on television. How unnatural. But if you've ever once been the object of that terrible, blank, round, glass stare, you know all too well how self-conscious it makes you. A harried guy with earphones and a clipboard tells you to act natural, as your face begins to leap around on your skull, struggling for a seemingly unwatched expression that feels impossible, because seeming unwatched is, like the act natural which fathered it, oxymoronic. Try driving a golf ball as someone asks you whether you in or exhale on your backswing, or getting promised lavish rewards if you can avoid thinking of a rhinoceros for 10 seconds, and you'll get some idea of the truly heroic contortions of body and mind that must be required for Don Johnson to act unwatched as he's watched by a lens that's an overwhelming emblem of what Emerson, years before TV, called the gaze of millions. Only a certain very rare species of person, for Emerson, is fit to stand the gaze of millions. It is not your normal, hard-working, quietly desperate species of American. The man who can stand the mega-gaze is a walking imago, a certain type of transcendent freak who, for Emerson, carries the holiday in his eye. The Emersonian holiday television actors' eyes carry is the potent illusion of a vacation from self-consciousness not worrying about how you come across, a total unallergy to gazes. It is contemporarily heroic. It is frightening and strong. It is also, of course, an act, a counterfeit impression. For you have to be just abnormally self-conscious and self-controlling to appear unwatched before lenses. The self-conscious appearance of unself-consciousness is the grand illusion behind TV's mirror hall of illusions, and for us, the audience, it is both medicine and poison. For we gaze at these rare, highly trained, seemingly unwatched people for six hours daily. And we love these people. In terms of attributing to them true supernatural assets and desiring to emulate them, we sort of worship them. In a real Joe Briefcase type world that shifts ever more starkly from some community of relationships to networks of strangers connected by self-interest and contest and image, the people we espy on TV offer us familiarity, community, intimate friendship. But we split what we see. The characters are our close friends, but the performers are beyond strangers. They're images, demigods, and they move in a different sphere, hang out with and marry only each other, seem, even as actors, accessible to audience only via the mediation of tabloids, talk show, EM signal. And yet, both actors and characters, so terribly removed and filtered, seem so natural when we watch. Given how much we watch and what watching means, it's inevitable but toxic for those of us fictionists or Joe Briefcases who wish to be voyeurs to get the idea that these persons behind the glass, persons who are often the most colorful, attractive, animated, alive people in our daily experience, are also people who are oblivious to the fact that they're being watched. It's toxic for allergic people because it sets up an alienating cycle, and also for writers because it replaces fiction research with a weird kind of fiction consumption. We self-conscious Americans over sensitivity to real humans fixes us before the television and its ball-check valve 
in an attitude of rapt, relaxed reception. We watch various actors play various characters, etc. For 360 minutes per diem, we receive unconscious reinforcement of the deep thesis that the most significant feature of truly alive persons is watchableness, and that genuine human worth is not just identical with, but rooted in the phenomenon of watching, and that the single biggest part of real watchableness is seeming to be unaware that there's any watching going on, acting natural. The persons we young fiction writers and assorted shut-ins most study, feel for, feel through, are, by virtue of a genius for feigned unself-consciousness, fit to stand gazes. And we, trying desperately to be nonchalant, perspire creepily on the subway. The Finger Weighty existential predicaments aside, there is no denying that people in the USA watch so much television because it's fun. I know I watch for fun most of the time, and that at least 51% of the time I do have fun when I watch. This doesn't mean I do not take television seriously. One claim of this essay is that the most dangerous thing about television for US fiction writers is that we yield to the temptation not to take television seriously as both a disseminator and a definer of the cultural atmosphere we breathe and process. That many of us are so blinded by constant exposure that we regard TV the way Reagan's lame FCC chairman Mark Fowler professed to in 1981, as just another appliance, a toaster with pictures. Television, nevertheless, is just plain pleasurable, though it may seem odd that so much of the pleasure my generation gets from television lies in making fun of it. But you have to remember that younger Americans grew up as much with people's disdain for TV as we did with TV itself. I knew it was a vast wasteland way before I knew who Newton Minow or Mark Fowler were. And it's just fun to laugh cynically at television, at the way the laughter from sitcoms' live studio audience is always suspiciously constant in pitch and duration, or at the way travel is depicted on the Flintstones by having the exact same cut-rate cartoon tree, rock, and house go by four times. It's fun when a withered June Allison comes on screen for depend adult undergarments and says, if you have a bladder control problem, you're not alone, to hoot and shout back, well, chances are you're alone quite a bit, June. Most scholars and critics who write about U.S. popular culture, though, seem both to take TV seriously and to suffer real pain over what they see. There's this well-known critical litany about television's vapidity, shallowness, and irrealism. The litany is often far cruder and triter than what the critics complain about, which I think is why most younger viewers find pro-criticism of television far less interesting than pro-television itself. I found solid examples of what I'm talking about on the first day I even looked. The New York Times Arts and Leisure section for Sunday, August 5th, 1990, simply bulged with bitter critical derision for TV. And some of the most unhappy articles weren't about just low-quality programming, so much as about how TV's become this despicable instrument of cultural decay. In a summary review of all 1990's crash-and-burn summer box office hits, in which, quote, realism seems to have gone almost entirely out of fashion, Janet Maslin locates her true anti-reality culprit. Quote, we may be hearing about real life on television shows made up of 15-second sound bites, in which real people not only speak in brief, neat truisms, but actually seem to think that way, perhaps as a result of having watched too much reality molding television themselves, end quote. And one Stephen Holden, in what starts out as a mean pop music article, knows perfectly well what's behind what he hates. Quote, Pop music is no longer a world unto itself, but an adjunct of television, whose stream of commercial images projects a culture in which everything is for sale, and the only things that count are fame, power, and the body beautiful. End quote. This stuff just goes on and on in the times. The only arts and leisure piece I could find with anything upbeat to say about TV that morning was a breathless article on how lots of Ivy League graduates are now flying straight from school to New York and Los Angeles to become television writers and are clearing well over $200,000 to start and enjoying rapid advancement to a harried, clipboarded production status. 
In this regard, August 5th's Times is a good example of a strange mix that's been around for a few years now. Weary contempt for television as a creative product and cultural force, combined with beady-eyed fascination about the actual behind-the-glass mechanics of making that product, projecting that force. Surely we all have friends we just hate to hear talk about TV, because they so clearly loathe it. They sneer relentlessly at the hackneyed plots, the unlikely dialogue, the cheese whiz resolutions, the bland condescension of the news anchors, the shrill wheedling of commercials, and yet are just as clearly obsessed with it. Somehow need to hate their six hours a day, day in and out. Junior advertising executives, aspiring filmmakers, and graduate school poets are, in my experience, especially prone to this condition, where they simultaneously hate, fear, and need television and try to disinfect themselves of whatever so much viewing might do to them by watching TV with weary irony, instead of the rapt credulity most of us grew up with. Note that most fiction writers still tend to go for the rapt credulity. But, since the wearily disgusted Times has its own demographic thumb on the pulse of news readerly taste, it's safe to conclude that most educated, Times-buying Americans are wearily disgusted by television, have this weird, hate, need, fear, six hours daily gestalt about it. Published TV scholarship sure reflects this mood. And the numbingly dull quality to most literary television analyses is due less to the turgid abstraction scholars employ to make television seem an okay object of aesthetic inquiry. Compare a 1986 treatise. Quote, The form of my Tuesday evening's primetime pleasure is structured by a dialectic of elision and rift among various windows through which flow is more of a circumstance than a product. The real output is the quantum, the smallest maneuverable broadcast bit." End quote. Then to the tired, jaded cynicism of television experts who mock and revile the very phenomenon they've chosen as scholarly vocation. It's like people who despise, I mean big-time, long-term despise their spouses or jobs, but won't split up or quit. Critical complaint degenerates quickly into plain whining. The fecund question about US television is no longer whether there are some truly nasty problems here, but rather what on earth's to be done about them. On this question, pop critics are mute. In fact, it's in the US arts, particularly in certain strands of contemporary American fiction, that the really interesting questions about end-of-the-century TV. What is it about televisual culture that we so hate? Why are we so immersed in it if we hate it so? What implications are there in our sustained, voluntary immersion in stuff we hate are being addressed? But they are also, weirdly, being asked and answered by television itself. This is another reason why most TV criticism seems so empty. Television's managed to become its own most profitable critic. AM, August 5th, 1990 as I was scanning and sneering at the sneering tone of the predominant Times articles, a syndicated episode of St. Elsewhere was on the TV, cleaning up in a Sunday morning Boston market otherwise occupied by televangelists, infomercials, and the steroid and polyurethane-ridden American gladiators, itself not charmless but definitely a low-dose show. Syndication is another new area of public fascination, not only because huge cable stations like Chicago's WGN and Atlanta's WTBS have upped the stakes from local to national, but because syndication is changing the whole creative philosophy of network television. Since it is in syndication deals, where the distributor gets both an upfront fee for a program and a percentage of the ad slots for his own commercials, that the creators of successful television series realize truly gross profits. Many new programs are designed and pitched with both immediate primetime and down-the-road syndication audiences in mind, and are now informed less by dreams of the 10-year beloved TV institution type run, Gunsmoke, MASH, than of a modest three-year run that yields the 78 in-can episodes required for an attractive syndication package. I, like millions of other Americans, Know this stuff only because I saw a special three-part report about syndication on Entertainment Tonight, itself the first nationally syndicated news program, and the first infomercial so popular that TV stations were willing to pay for it. Sunday syndication is also intriguing 
because it makes for juxtapositions as eerily opposite as anything French surrealists could contrive. Lovable warlocks on Bewitched and commercially satanic heavy metal videos on America's Top 40 run opposite airbrushed preachers decrying demonism in U.S. culture. Or better, August 5th's St. Elsewhere episode 94, originally broadcast in 1988, aired on Boston's Channel 38 immediately following two back-to-back -back episodes of The Mary Tyler Moore Show, that icon of 70s pathos. The plots of the two Mary Tyler Moore shows are unimportant here, but the St. Elsewhere episode that followed them partly concerned a cameo role mental patient afflicted with the delusional belief that he was Mary Richards from the Mary Tyler Moore Show. He further believed that a fellow cameo role mental patient was Rhoda, that Dr. Westfall was Mr. Grant, and that Dr. Auschlander was Murray. The psychiatric subplot was a one-shot. It was resolved by episode's end. The pseudo-Mary a sad, lumpy-looking guy who used to play one of Dr. Hartley's neurotic clients on the old Bob Newhart show, rescues the other cameo role mental patient, whom he believes to be Rhoda, and who has been furious in his denials that he is female, much less fictional, and who is himself played by the guy who used to play Mr. Carlin, Dr. Hartley's most intractable client, from assault by a bit part hebephrine. In gratitude, Rhoda slash Mr. Carlin slash mental patient declares that he'll consent to be Rhoda if that's what Mary slash neurotic client slash mental patient wants. At this too real generosity, the pseudo-Mary's psychotic break breaks. The sad guy admits to Dr. Auschlander that he's not Mary Richards. He's actually just a plain old amnesiac, minus a self, existentially adrift. He has no idea who he is. He's lonely. He watches a lot of television. He figured it was better to believe I was a TV character than not to believe I was anybody. Dr. Ashlander takes the penitent patient for a walk in the wintry Boston air and promises that he, the identityless guy, can someday find out who he really is, provided he can dispense with the distraction of television. At this cheery prognosis, the patient removes his own fuzzy winter beret and throws it into the air. The episode ends with a freeze of the aloft hat, leaving at least one viewer credulously wrapped. This would have been just another clever, low-concept 80s TV story, were the final cap-tossing and closing credits coyly undercut Dr. Auschlander's put-down of television, were it not for the countless layers of ironic, involuted TV imagery and data that whirl around this high-concept installment. Because another of this episode's cameo stars, drifting through a different subplot, is one Betty White, Sue Ann Nivens of the old Mary Tyler Moore Show, here playing a tortured NASA surgeon. Don't ask. It is with almost tragic inevitability, then, that Miss White, at 32 minutes into the episode, meets up with the TV-deluded pseudo-Mary in their respective tortured wanderings through the hospital's corridors, and that she considers the mental patient's inevitable joyful cries of Sue Ann with a too-straight face, and says he must have her confused with someone else. Of the convolved levels of fantasy and reality and identity here, for example, patient simultaneously does, does not, and does have Betty White confused with Sue Ann Nivens. We needn't speak in detail. Doubtless, a Yale contemporary culture dissertation is underway on R.D. Lang in just this episode. But the most interesting levels of meaning here lie and point behind the lens. For NBC's St. Elsewhere, like the Mary Tyler Moore show and the Bob Newhart show before it, was created, produced, and guided into syndication by MTM Studios, owned by Mary Tyler Moore and overseen by her husband, later NBC chair Grant Tinker. And St. Elsewhere's scripts and subplots are story edited by Mark Tinker, Mary's step, Grant's heir. The deluded mental patient, an exiled drifting veteran of one MTM program, reaches piteously out to the exiled, drifting, literally NASA for God's sake, veteran of another MTM production, and her ironic rebuff is scripted by KM personnel, who accomplish the parodic undercut of MTM's Dr. Auschlander with the copyrighted MTM hat gesture of one MTM veteran who's deluded he's another. Dr. A's Fowler-esque dismissal of TV as just a distraction is less absurd than incoherent. There is nothing but television on this episode. Every joke and dramatic surge depends on involution, meta-television, it is in-joke within in-joke. 
So then why do I get it? Because I, the viewer, outside the glass with the rest of the audience, am nevertheless in on the in-joke. I've seen Mary Tyler Moore's real toss of that fuzzy beret so often, it's moved past cliché into nostalgia. I know the mental patient from Bob Newhart, Betty White from everywhere, and I know all sorts of intriguing, irrelevant stuff about MTM Studios and syndication from Entertainment Tonight. I, the pseudo-voyeur, am indeed behind the scenes, for in-joke purposes. But it is not I, the spy, who have crept inside television's boundaries. It is vice versa. Television, even the mundane little businesses of its production, have become our interior, and we seem a jaded, jeering, but willing and knowledgeable audience. This St. Elsewhere episode was nominated for an Emmy, for Best Original Teleplay. The best TV of the last five years has been about ironic self-reference like no previous species of postmodern art could have dreamed of. The colors of MTV videos, blue-black and lambently flickered, are the colors of television. Moonlighting's Bruce and Bueller's Ferris throw asides to the viewer every bit as bald as the old melodrama villain's monologued gloat. Segments of the new late-night glitz news after hours end with a tease that features harried headphone guys in the production booth ordering the tease. MTV's television trivia game show, the dry-titled Remote Control, got so popular it busted its own MTV membrane and is in 1990 now syndicated band-wide. The hippest commercials, with stark computerized settings and blank beauties in mirrored shades and plastic slacks genuflecting before various forms of velocity, force, and adrenaline, seem like little more than TV's vision of how TV offers rescue to those lonely Joe briefcases, passively trapped into watching too much TV. What explains the pointlessness of most published TV criticism is that television has become immune to charges that it lacks any meaningful connection to the world outside it. It's not that charges of non-connection have become untrue, it's that any such connection has become otios. Television used to point beyond itself. Those of us born in, like, the 60s were trained to look where it pointed, usually at versions of real life, made prettier, sweeter, better, by succumbing to a product or temptation. Today's audience is way better trained, and TV has discarded what's not needed. A dog, if you point at something, will only look at your finger. Meta-watching It's not like self-reference is new to mass entertainment. How many old radio shows, Jack Benny, Martin and Lewis, Abbott and Costello, were mostly about themselves as shows? So, Jerry, and you said I couldn't get a big star like Miss Lucille Ball to be on a guest show, you little twerp, etc. But once television introduces the element of watching, and once it informs an economy and culture like radio never did, the referential stakes go way up. Six hours a day is more time than most people consciously do any one thing. How people who absorb such doses understand themselves changes, becomes spectatorial, self-conscious. Because the practice of watching is expansive, exponential. We spend enough time watching, pretty soon we start watching ourselves watching. We start to feel ourselves feeling, yearn to experience experiences. And that American subspecies into writing starts writing more and more about... The emergence of something called metafiction in the American 60s was and is hailed by academic critics as a radical aesthetic a whole new literary form, unshackled from the canonical cinctures of narrative and mimesis, and free to plunge into reflexivity and self-conscious meditations on aboutness. Radical it may have been, but thinking that postmodern metafiction evolved unconscious of prior changes in readerly taste is about as innocent as thinking that all those students we saw on television protesting the war in Southeast Asia were protesting only because they hated the war. They may have hated the war, but they also wanted to be seen protesting on television. TV was where they'd seen this war, after all. Why wouldn't they go about hating it on the very medium that made their hate possible? Metafictionists may have had aesthetic theories out the bazoo, but they were also sentient citizens of a community that was exchanging an old idea of itself as a nation of doers and beers for a new vision of the USA as an atomized mass of self-conscious watchers and appearers. Metafiction, for its time, 
was nothing more than a poignant hybrid of its theoretical foe, realism. If realism called it like it saw it, metafiction simply called it as it saw itself seeing itself see it. This high cultural postmodern genre, in other words, was deeply informed by the emergence of television, and American fiction remains informed by TV, especially those strains of fiction with roots in postmodernism, which, even at its rebellious zenith, was less a response to televisual culture than a kind of abiding in TV. Even back then, the borders were starting to come down. It's strange that it took television itself so long to wake up to watching's potent reflexivity. Television shows about television shows were rare for a long time. The Dick Van Dyke show was prescient, and Mary Moore carried its insight into her own decade-long study in local market angst. Now, of course, there's been everything from Murphy Brown to Max Headroom to Entertainment Tonight, and with Letterman, Arsenio, and Lino's battery of hip sardonic this is just TV shticks, the circle back to the days of so glad to get Miss Ball on our show has closed and come spiral. Television's power to jettison connection and castrate protest fueled by the same ironic postmodern self-consciousness it first helped fashion. It's going to take a while, but I'm going to prove to you that the nexus where television and fiction converse and consort is self-conscious irony. Irony is, of course, a turf fictionists have long worked with zeal. And irony is important for understanding TV because TV, now that it's gotten powerful enough to move from acronym to way of life, revolves off just the sorts of absurd contradiction irony is all about exposing. It is ironic that television is a syncresis that celebrates diversity, that an extremely unattractive self-consciousness is necessary to create TV performers' illusion of unconscious appeal that products presented as helping you express individuality can afford to be advertised on television only because they sell to huge hordes, and so on. Television regards irony the way the educated lonely regard television. Television both fears irony's capacity to expose and needs it. It needs irony because television was practically made for irony, for TV is a bisensuous medium. Its displacement of radio wasn't picture displacing sound, it was picture added. Since the tension between what's said and what's seen is irony's wholesale territory, classic televisual irony works not via the juxtaposition of conflicting pictures or conflicting sounds, but with sights that undercut what's said. A scholarly article on Network News describes a famous interview with the corporate guy from United Fruit on a CBS special about Guatemala. I sure don't know of anybody being so-called oppressed, the guy in a 70s leisure suit with a tie that looks like an omelette tells Ed Rabble. I think this is just something that some reporters have thought up. The whole interview is intercut with commentless pictures of big-bellied kids in Guatemalan slums and union organizers lying there with cut throats. Television's classic irony function came into its own in the summer of 1974, as remorseless lenses opened to view the fertile credibility gap between the image of official disclaimer and the reality of high-level shenanigans. A nation was changed as audience. If even the president lies to you, whom are you supposed to trust to deliver the real? Television, that summer, presented itself as the earnest, worried eye on the reality behind all images. The irony that television is itself a river of image, however, was apparent even to a 12-year-old, sitting there, wrapped. There seemed to be no way out. Images and ironies all over the place. It's not a coincidence that Saturday Night Live, that Athens of irreverent cynicism, specializing in parodies of one, politics, and two, television, premiered the next fall. On television. I'm worried when I say things like television fears and television presents itself, because even though it's an abstraction necessary to discourse, talking about television as if it were an entity can easily slip into the worst sort of anti-TV paranoia, treating of TV as some autonomous, diabolical corrupter of personal agency and community gumption. I am anxious to avoid anti-TV paranoia here. Though I'm convinced that television lies, with a potency somewhere between symptom and synecdoche, behind a genuine crisis for US culture and lit today, I don't share reactionary adults' vision of TV as some malignancy visited on an innocent populace, sapping IQs, 
and compromising SAT scores, while we all sit there on ever fatter bottoms with little mesmerized spirals revolving in our eyes. Because conservative critics like Samuel Huntington and Barbara Tuchman, who try to claim that TV's lowering of our aesthetic standards is responsible for a, quote, contemporary culture taken over by commercialism, directed to the mass market and necessarily to mass taste, end quote, can be refuted by observing that their propter hoc isn't even post hoc. By 1830, de Tocqueville had already diagnosed American culture as peculiarly devoted to easy sensation and mass-marketed entertainment. Spectacles vehement and untutored and rude, that aimed to stir the passions more than to gratify the taste. It's undeniable that television is an example of low art, the sort of art that tries too hard to please. Because of the economics of nationally broadcast, advertiser-subsidized entertainment, television's one goal, never denied by anybody, in or around TV since RCA first authorized field tests in 1936, is to ensure as much watching as possible. TV is the epitome of low art in its desire to appeal to and enjoy the attention of unprecedented numbers of people. But TV is not low because it is vulgar or prurient or stupid. It is often all these things, but this is a logical function of its need to please audience. And I'm not saying that television is vulgar and dumb because the people who compose audience are vulgar and dumb. Television is the way it is simply because people tend to be really similar in their vulgar and prurient and stupid interests and wildly different in their refined and moral and intelligent interests. It's all about syncretic diversity. Neither medium nor viewers are responsible for quality. Still, for the fact that American humans consume vulgar, prurient, and stupid stuff at the sobering clip of six hours a day, for this both TV and we need to answer. We are responsible basically because nobody is holding any weapons on us, forcing us to spend amounts of time second only to sleep, doing something that is, when you come right down to it, not good for us. Sorry to sound judgmental, but there it is. Six hours a day is not good. Television's biggest minute-by-minute -minute appeal is that it engages without demanding. One can rest while undergoing stimulation. Receive without giving. In this respect, television resembles other things mothers call special treats. Candy or liquor. Treats that are basically fine and fun in small amounts, but bad for us in large amounts and really bad for us if consumed as any kind of nutritive staple. One can only guess what volume of gin or poundage of Toblerone six hours of special treat a day would convert to. On the surface of the problem, television is responsible for our rate of its consumption only in that it's become so terribly successful at its acknowledged job of ensuring prodigious amounts of watching. Its social accountability seems sort of like that of designers of military weapons. Unculpable right up until they get a little too good at their job. But the analogy between television and liquor is best, I think, because I'm afraid Joe Briefcase is a teleholic. Watching TV can become malignantly addictive. TV may become malignantly addictive only once a certain threshold of quantity is habitually passed, but then the same is true of whiskey. And by malignant and addictive, I again do not mean evil or coercive. An activity is addictive if one's relationship to it lies on that downward sloping continuum between liking it a little too much and downright needing it. Many addictions, from exercise to letter writing, are pretty benign. But something is malignantly addictive if 1. it causes real problems for the addict, and 2. it offers itself as relief from the very problems it causes. A malignant addiction is also distinguished for spreading the problems of the addiction out and in in interference patterns, creating difficulties for relationships, communities, and the addict's very sense of self and soul. The hyperbole might strain the analogy for you, but concrete illustrations of malignant TV watching cycles aren't hard to come by. If it's true that many Americans are lonely, and if it's true that many lonely people are prodigious TV watchers, and if it's true that lonely people find in television's 2D images relief from the pain of their reluctance to be around real humans, then it's also obvious that the more time spent watching TV, the less time spent in the real human world, and the less time spent in the real human world, 
the harder it becomes to not feel alienated from real humans, solipsistic, lonely. It's also true that to the extent one begins to view pseudo-relationships with Bud Bundy or Jane Pauley as acceptable alternatives to relationships with real humans, one has commensurately less conscious incentive even to try to connect with real 3D persons, connections that are pretty important to mental health. For Joe Briefcase, as for many addicts, the special treat of TV begins to substitute for something nourishing and needed, and the original hunger subsides to a strange, objectless unease. TV watching as a malignant cycle doesn't even require special preconditions like writerly self-consciousness or loneliness. Let's for a second imagine Joe Briefcase as now just average, relatively unlonely, adjusted, married, blessed with 2.5 apple-cheeked issue, normal, home from hard work at 5.30, starting his average six-hour stint. Since Joe B. is average, he'll shrug at pollsters' questions and say he most often watches television to unwind from those elements of his day and life he finds stressful. It's tempting to suppose that TV enables this unwinding simply because it offers an Auslanderian distraction, something to divert the mind from quotidian troubles. But would mere distraction ensure continual massive watching? Television offers more than distraction. In lots of ways, television pervades and enables dreams, and most of these dreams involve some sort of transcendence of average daily life. The modes of presentation that work best for TV, stuff like action with shootouts and car wrecks, or the rapid-fire collage of commercials, news and music videos, or the hysteria of primetime soap and sitcom with broad gestures, high voices, too much laughter, are unsubtle in their whispers that Somewhere, life is quicker, denser, more interesting, more, well, lively than contemporary life as Joe Briefcase knows and moves through it. This might seem benign until we consider that what average Joe Briefcase does more than almost anything else in contemporary life is watch television, an activity which anyone with an average brain can see does not make for a very dense and lively life. Since television must seek to compel attention, by offering a dreamy promise of escape from daily life, and since stats confirm that so grossly much of ordinary U.S. life is watching TV, TV's whispered promises must somehow undercut television watching in theory. Joe, Joe, there's a world where life is lively, where nobody spends six hours a day unwinding before a piece of furniture, while reinforcing television watching in practice. Joe, Joe, your best and only access to this world is TV. Well, Joe Briefcase has an average workable brain, and deep inside he knows, as we do, that there's some kind of psychic three-card Monty going on in this system of conflicting whispers. But if it's so bald a delusion, why do we keep watching such doses? Part of the answer, a part which requires discretion lest it slip into anti-TV paranoia, is that the phenomenon of television somehow trains or conditions our viewership. Television has become able not only to ensure that we watch, but to inform our deepest responses to what's watched. Take jaded TV critics, or our acquaintances who sneer at the numbing sameness of all the television they sit still for. I always want to grab these unhappy guys by the lapels and shake them until their teeth rattle, and point to the absence of guns to their heads, and ask why the heck they keep watching then. But the truth is that there's some complex, high-dose psychic transaction between TV and audience whereby audience gets trained to respond to, and then like, and then expect trite, hackneyed, numbing television shows, and to expect them to such an extent that when networks do occasionally abandon time-tested formulas, we usually punish them for it by not watching novel forms in sufficient numbers to let them get off the ground. Hence, the network's bland response to its critics that in the majority of cases, and until the rise of hip meta-television, you could count the exceptions on one hand. Different or high-concept programming simply didn't get ratings. Quality television cannot stand the gaze of millions, somehow. Now, it is true that certain PR techniques, shock, grotesquerie, or irreverence, can ease novel sorts of shows' rise to demographic viability. Examples here might be the shocking A Current Affair, the grotesque 
real people, the irreverent married with children. But these programs, like most of those touted by the industry as fresh or outrageous, turn out to be just tiny transparent variations on old formulas. But it's still not fair to blame television's shortage of originality on any lack of creativity among network talent. The truth is that we seldom get a chance to know whether anybody behind any TV show is creative, or more accurately, that they seldom get a chance to show us. Despite the unquestioned assumption on the part of pop culture critics that television's poor audience deep down craves novelty, all available evidence suggests rather that the audience really craves sameness, but thinks deep down that it ought to crave novelty. Hence the mixture of devotion and sneer on viewerly faces. Hence also the weird viewer complicity behind TV's sham breakthrough programs. Joe Briefcase needs that PR patina of freshness and outrageousness to quiet his conscience while he goes about getting from television what we've all been trained to want from it. Some strangely American, profoundly shallow reassurance. Particularly in the last decade, this tension in the audience between what we do want and what we think we ought to want has been television's breath and bread. TV's self-mocking invitation to itself as indulgence, transgression, a glorious giving in, again not foreign to addictive cycles, is one of two ingenious ways it's consolidated its six-hour hold on my generation's cojones. The other is postmodern irony. The commercials for ALF's Boston debut in syndicated package feature the fat, cynical, gloriously decadent puppet, so much like Snoopy, like Garfield, like Bart, advising me to eat a whole lot of food and stare at the TV. His pitch is an ironic permission slip to do what I do best whenever I feel confused and guilty. Assume inside a sort of fetal position, a pose of passive reception to escape, comfort, reassurance. The cycle is self-nourishing. Guilty Fictions Not, again, that this cycle's root conflict is new. You can trace the opposition between what persons do and ought to desire at least as far back as Plato's Chariot, or The Prodigal's Return. But the way entertainments appeal to and work within this conflict has been transformed in a televisual culture. The culture of watching's relation to the cycle of indulgence, guilt, and reassurance has important consequences for U.S. art, and though the parallels are easiest to see with respect to Warhol's pop or Elvis's rock, the most interesting intercourse is between television and American lit. One of the most recognizable things about this century's postmodern fiction was the movement's strategic deployment of pop cultural references, brand names, celebrities, television programs, in even its loftiest high art projects. Think of just about any example of avant-garde U.S. fiction in the last 25 years, from Slothrop's passion for slippery elm throat lozenges and his weird encounter with Mickey Rooney in Gravity's Rainbow, to U's fetish for the New York Post's Coma Baby feature in Bright Lights, to Don DeLillo's pop-hip characters sing stuff to each other like, quote, Elvis fulfilled the terms of the contract, excess, deterioration, self-destructiveness, grotesque behavior, a physical bloating and a series of insults to the brain self-delivered, end quote. The apotheosis of the pop in post-war art marked a whole new marriage between high and low culture. For the artistic viability of postmodernism is a direct consequence, again, not of any new facts about art, but of facts about the new importance of mass commercial culture. Americans seemed no longer united so much by common feelings as by common images. What binds us became what we stood witness to. No one did or does see this as a good change. In fact, pop cultural references have become such potent metaphors in U.S. fiction not only because of how united Americans are in our exposure to mass images, but also because of our guilty, indulgent psychology with respect to that exposure. Put simply, the pop reference works so well in contemporary fiction because, one, we all recognize such a reference, and two, we're all a little uneasy about how we all recognize such a reference. The status of low cultural images in postmodern and contemporary fiction is very different from their place in postmodernism's artistic ancestors. 
the dirty realism of a Joyce, or the ur dadaism of a Duchamp toilet sculpture. Duchamp's display of that vulgarest of appliances served an exclusively theoretical end. It was making statements like, the museum is the mausoleum is the men's room, etc. It was an example of what Octavio Paz calls meta-irony, an attempt to reveal that categories we divide into superior and arty, and inferior and vulgar, are in fact so interdependent as to be coextensive. The use of low references in today's literary fiction, on the other hand, serves a less abstract agenda. It is meant, one, to help create a mood of irony and irreverence, two, to make us uneasy and so comment on the vapidity of U.S. culture, and three, most important these days, to be just plain realistic. Pynchon and DeLillo were ahead of their time. Today, the belief that pop images are basically just mimetic devices is one of the attitudes that separates most U.S. fiction writers under 40 from the writerly generation that precedes us, reviews us, and designs our grad school curricula. This generation gap in conceptions of realism is again TV dependent. The U.S. generation born after 1950 is the first for whom television was something to be lived with instead of just looked at. Our elders regard the set rather as the flapper did the automobile. A curiosity turned treat turned seduction. For younger writers, TV's as much a part of reality as Toyota's and Gridlock. We literally cannot imagine life without it. We're not different from our fathers insofar as television presents and defines the contemporary world, but we are different in that we have no memory of a world without such electric definition. This is why the derision so many older fictionists heap on a brat pack generation they see as insufficiently critical of mass culture is simultaneously apt and misguided. It's true that there's something sad about the fact that young lion David Levitt's sole descriptions of certain story characters is that their t-shirts have certain brand names on them. But the fact is that for most of the educated young readership for whom Levitt writes, members of a generation raised and nourished on messages equating what one consumes with who one is, Levitt's descriptions do the job. In our post-50, inseparable from TV association pool, Brand loyalty is synecdochic of identity, character. For those U.S. writers whose ganglia were formed pre-TV, who are big on neither Duchamp nor Paz, and lack the oracular foresight of a pension, the mimetic deployment of pop culture icons seems at best an annoying tick, and at worst, a dangerous vapidity that compromises fiction's seriousness by dating it out of the platonic always where it ought to reside. In one of the graduate workshops I suffered through, an earnest gray eminence kept trying to convince our class that a literary story or novel always eschews, quote, any feature which serves to date it, because serious fiction must be timeless. When we finally protested that, in his own well-known work, characters moved about in electrically lit rooms, drove cars, spoke not Anglo-Saxon but post-war English, inhabited a North America already separated from Africa by continental drift, he impatiently amended his prescription to those explicit references that would date a story in the frivolous now. When pressed for just what stuff evoked this frivolous now, he said of course he meant the trendy mass popular media reference. And here, at just this point, transgenerational discourse broke down. We looked at him blankly. We scratched our little heads. We didn't get it. This guy and his students just didn't imagine the serious world the same way. His automobile timeless and our FCC'd own were different. If you read the big literary supplements, you've doubtless seen the intergenerational squabble the predominant scene explains. The plain fact is that certain key things having to do with fiction production are different for young US writers now, and television is at the vortex of much of the flux. Because younger writers are not only artists probing for the nobler interstices in what Stanley Cavill calls the reader's willingness to be pleased, we are also now self-defined parts of the great U.S. audience and have our own aesthetic pleasure centers, and television has formed and trained us. It won't do, then, for the literary establishment simply to complain that, for instance, young written characters don't have very interesting dialogues with each other, that 
young writer's ears seem tinny. Tinny they may be, but the truth is that in younger Americans' experience, people in the same room don't do all that much direct conversing with each other. What most of the people I know do is they all sit and face the same direction and stare at the same thing, and then structure commercial-length conversations around the sorts of questions myopic car crash witnesses might ask each other. Did you see what I just saw? And realism-wise, the paucity of profound conversation in Brat-esque fiction seems to be mimetic of more than just our own generation. Six hours a day, in average households young and old, just how much interfacing can really be going on. So now whose literary aesthetic seems dated? In terms of lit history, it's important to recognize the distinction between pop and televisual references on the one hand, and the mere use of TV-like techniques on the other. The latter have been around in fiction forever. The Voltaire of Candide, for instance, uses a bisensuous irony that would do Ed Rabble proud, having Candide and Pangloss run around smiling and saying, all for the best, the best of all worlds, amid war-dead, pogroms, rampant nastiness. Even the stream-of-consciousness guys who fathered modernism were, on a very high level, constructing the same sorts of illusions about privacy puncturing and espial on the forbidden that television has found so fecund. And let's not even talk about Balzac. It was in post-atomic America that pop influences on lit became something more than technical. About the time that television first gasped and sucked air, mass popular U.S. culture became high art viable as a collection of symbols and myth. The episcopate of this pop reference movement were the post-Nabokovian black humorists, the metafictionists, and assorted Frank and Latinophiles, only later comprised by postmodern. The erudite, sardonic fictions of the black humorists introduced a generation of new fiction writers who saw themselves as avant-avant-garde, not only cosmopolitan and polyglot, but also technologically literate, products of more than just one region, heritage, and theory, and citizens of a culture that said its most important stuff about itself via mass media. In this regard, I think particularly of the Barth of the end of the road in the Sotweed Factor, the Gaddis of the Recognitions, and the Pynchon of the Crying of Lot 49. But the movement toward treating of the pop as its own reservoir of mythopia fast metastasized and has transcended both school and genre. Plucking from my bookshelves almost at random, I find poet James Cummins' 1986 The Whole Truth, a cycle of Sestinas deconstructing Perry Mason. Here's Robert Coover's 1977 A Public Burning, in which Eisenhower buggers Nixon on air, and his 1980 A Political Fable, in which The Cat in the Hat runs for president. I find Max Apple's 1986 The Profiteers, a novel-length imagining of Walt Disney's travails, or part of poet Bill Knott's 1974 and other travels. Quote, In my hand, a cat o' nine tails, on every tip of which was clear sill. I was worried because Dick Clark had told the cameraman not to put the camera on me during the dance parts of the show, because my skirts were too tight. End quote. Which serves as a lovely example, because, even though this stanza appears in the poem without anything we'd normally call context or support, it is in fact self-supported by a reference we all, each of us, immediately get conjuring as it does with bandstand ritualized vanity, teenage insecurity, the management of spontaneous moments. It is the perfect pop image, at once slight and universal, soothing and discomforting. Recall that the phenomena of watching and consciousness of watching are by nature expansive. What distinguishes another, later wave of postmodern lit is a further shift, from television images as valid objects of literary illusion to TV and meta-watching as themselves valid subjects. By this, I mean certain lit beginning to locate its raison in its commentary on, response to, a U.S. culture more and more of and for watching, illusion, and the video image. This involution of attention was first observable in academic poetry. See, for instance, Stephen Dobbins' 1980, Arrested Saturday Night. Quote, This is how it happened. Peg and Bob had invited Jack and Roxanne over to their house to watch the TV, and on the big screen they saw Peg and Bob, Jack and Roxanne watching themselves watch themselves on progressively smaller TVs. End quote. 
or Knott's 1983 Crash Course, quote, I strap a TV monitor on my chest so that all who approach me can see themselves and respond appropriately, end quote. The true prophet of this shift in U.S. fiction, though, was the predominant Don DeLillo, a long-neglected conceptual novelist who has made signal and image his unifying topoi the way Barth and Pynchon had sculpted in paralysis and paranoia a decade earlier. DeLillo's 1985 White Noise sounded to fledgling fictionists a kind of televisual clarion call. Scenelets like the following seemed especially important. Quote, Several days later, Murray asked me about a tourist attraction known as the most photographed barn in America. We drove 22 miles into the country around Farmington. There were meadows and apple orchards. White fences trailed through the rolling fields. Soon, the signs started appearing. The most photographed barn in America. We counted five signs before we reached the site. We walked along a cow path to the slightly elevated spot set aside for viewing and photographing. All the people had cameras. Some had tripods, telephoto lenses, filter kits. A man in a booth sold postcards and slides, pictures of the barn taken from the elevated spot. We stood near a grove of trees and watched the photographers. Murray maintained a prolonged silence, occasionally scrawling some notes in a little book. No one sees the barn, he said finally. A long silence followed. Once you've seen the signs about the barn, it becomes impossible to see the barn. He fell silent once more. People with cameras left the elevated site, replaced at once by others. We're not here to capture an image. We're here to maintain one. Can you feel it, Jack? An accumulation of nameless energies. There was an extended silence. The man in the booth sold postcards and slides. Being here is a kind of spiritual surrender. We see only what the others see. The thousands who were here in the past. Those who will come in the future. We've agreed to be part of a collective perception. This literally colors our vision. A religious experience in a way, like all tourism. Another silence ensued. They're taking pictures of taking pictures, he said. End quote. I quote this at such length not only because it's too darn good to ablate, but to draw your attention to two relevant features. The less interesting is the Dobbins-esque message here about the metastasis of watching. For not only are people watching a barn whose only claim to fame is as an object of watching, but the pop culture scholar Murray is watching people watch a barn, and his friend Jack is watching Murray watch the watching. And we readers are pretty obviously watching Jack the narrator watch Murray watching, etc. If you leave out the reader, there is a similar regress of recordings of barn and barn watching. But more important are the complicated ironies that work in the scene. The scene itself is obviously absurd and absurdist, but most of the writing's parodic force is directed at Murray, the would-be transcender of spectation. Murray, by watching and analyzing, would try to figure out the how and whys of giving in to collective visions of mass images that have themselves become mass images only because they've been made the objects of collective vision. The narrator's extended silence in response to Murray's blather speaks volumes, but it's not to be mistaken for a silence of sympathy with the sheep-like photograph-hungry crowd. These poor Joe briefcases are no less objects of ridicule for their scientific critic himself being ridiculed. The authorial tone throughout is a kind of deadpan sneer. Jack himself is utterly mute, since to speak out loud in the scene would render the narrator part of the farce, instead of a detached, transcendent observer and recorder, and so vulnerable to ridicule himself. With his silence, DeLillo's alter-ego Jack eloquently diagnoses the very disease from which he, Murray, barn watchers, and readers all suffer. I do have a thesis. I want to convince you that irony, poker face silence, and fear of ridicule are distinctive of those features of contemporary U.S. culture, of which cutting-edge fiction is a part, that enjoy any significant relation to the television whose weird pretty hand has my generation by the throat. I'm going to argue that irony and ridicule are entertaining and effective, and that at the same time they are agents of a great despair and stasis in U.S. culture, and that for aspiring fictionists they pose terrifically vexing problems. My two big premises are that, on the one hand, a certain subgenre of pop-conscious postmodern fiction, written mostly by young Americans, has lately arisen 
and made a real attempt to transfigure a world of and for appearance, mass appeal, and television, and that, on the other hand, televisual culture has somehow evolved to a point where it seems invulnerable to any such transfiguring assault. TV, in other words, has become able to capture and neutralize any attempt to change or even protest the attitudes of passive unease and cynicism TV requires of audience in order to be commercially and psychologically viable at doses of several hours per day. Image Fiction The particular fictional subgenre I have in mind has been called by some editors post-postmodernism, and by some critics hyperrealism. Most of the younger readers and writers I know call it the fiction of image. Image fiction is basically a further involution of the relations between lit and pop that blossomed with the 60s postmodernists. If the postmodern church fathers found pop images valid reference and symbols in fiction, and if in the 70s and early 80s this appeal to the features of mass culture shifted from use to mention, Certain avant-gardists starting to treat of pop and TV and watching as themselves fertile subjects, the new fiction of image uses the transient received myths of popular culture as a world in which to imagine fictions about real, albeit pop-mediated, public characters. Early uses of imagist tactics can be seen in the DeLillo of Great Jones Street, the Coover of Burning, and in Max Apple, whose 70s short story, The Oranging of America, projected an interior life onto the figure of Howard Johnson. But in the late 80s, despite publisher unease over the legalities of imagining private lives for public figures, a real bumper crop of this behind-the-glass stuff started appearing, authored largely by writers who didn't know or cross-fertilize one another. Apple's Profiteers, Jay Cantor's Crazy Cat, Coover's A Night at the Movies, or, you must remember this, William T. Volman's You Bright and Risen Angels, Stephen Dixon's movies, 17 stories, and DeLillo's own fictional hologram of Oswald in Libra are all notable post-85 instances. Observe, too, that in another 80s medium, the R.T. Zelig, Purple Rose of Cairo, and Sex, Lies, and Videotape, plus the low-budget scanners in Videodrome and Shockers, all began to treat screens as permeable. It's in the last couple of years that the image fiction scene has really taken off. A. M. Holmes, 1990, The Safety of Objects, features a stormy love affair between a boy and a Barbie doll. Volman's 1989 The Rainbow Stories has Sonys as characters in Heideggerian parables. Michael Martone's 1990 Fort Wayne is seventh on Hitler's list is a tight cycle of stories about the Midwest pop culture giants, James Dean, Colonel Sanders, Dillinger, the whole project of which, spelled out in a preface about image fiction's legal woes, involves questioning the border between fact and fiction when in the presence of fame. And Mark Lehner's 1990 campus smash, My Cousin, My Gastroenterologist, less a novel than what the book's jacket copy describes as a fiction analog of the best drug you ever took, features everything from meditations on the color of carefree panty shields wrappers to Big Squirrel, the TV kitty show host and kung fu mercenary, to NFL instant replays, in an X-ray vision which shows leaping skeletons in a bluish void surrounded by 75,000 roaring skulls. One thing I have to insist you realize about this new subgenre is that it's distinguished, not just by a certain neo-postmodern technique, but by a genuine socio-artistic agenda. The fiction of image is not just a use or mention of televisual culture, but a response to it an effort to impose some sort of accountability on a state of affairs in which more Americans get their news from television than from newspapers, and in which more Americans every evening watch Wheel of Fortune than all three network news programs combined. And please see that image fiction, far from being a trendy avant-garde novelty, is almost atavistic. It's a natural adaptation of the hoary techniques of literary realism to a 90s world whose defining boundaries have been deformed by electric signal. For realistic fiction's big job used to be to afford easements across borders, to help readers leap over walls of self and locale, and show us unseen or undreamed peoples and cultures and ways to be. Realism made the strange familiar. Today, when we can eat Tex-Mex with chopsticks while listening to reggae and watching a Soviet satellite newscast of the Berlin Wall's fall, i.e., 
when darn near everything presents itself as familiar, it's not a surprise that some of today's most ambitious realistic fiction is going about trying to make the familiar strange. In doing so, demanding fictional access behind lenses and screens and headlines and reimagining what human life might truly be like over there across the chasms of illusion, mediation, demographics, marketing, image, and appearance. Image fiction is paradoxically trying to restore what's mistaken for real to three whole dimensions. To reconstruct a univocally round world out of disparate streams of flat sights. That's the good news. The bad news is that, almost without exception, image fiction doesn't satisfy its own agenda. Instead, it most often degenerates into a kind of jeering, surfacy look behind the scenes of the very televisual front people already jeer at and can already get behind the scenes of via Entertainment Tonight and Remote Control. The reason why today's imagist fiction isn't the rescue from a passive, addictive TV psychology that it tries so hard to be is that most imagist writers render their material with the same tone of irony and self-consciousness that their ancestors, the literary insurgents of beat and postmodernism, used so effectively to rebel against their own world and context. And the reason why this irreverent postmodern approach fails to help the imagists transfigure TV is simply that TV has beaten the imagists to the punch. The fact is that for at least 10 years now, television has been ingeniously absorbing, homogenizing, and representing the very cynical postmodern aesthetic that was once the best alternative to the appeal of low, over-easy, mass-marketed narrative. How TV's done this is blackly fascinating to see. A quick intermission contra paranoia. By saying that the fiction of image aims to rescue us from TV, I again am not suggesting that television has diabolical designs or wants souls. I'm just referring again to the kind of audience conditioning consequent to high doses, a conditioning so subtle it can be observed best obliquely through examples. If a term like conditioning still seems hyperbolic or empty to you, I'll ask you to consider for a moment the exemplary issue of prettiness. One of the things that makes the people on TV fit to stand the mega gaze is that they are, by human standards, really pretty. I suspect that this, like most television conventions, is set up with no motive more sinister than to appeal to the largest possible audience. Pretty people tend to be more pleasing to look at than non-pretty people. But when we're talking about television, the combination of sheer audience size and quiet psychic intercourse between images and oglers starts a cycle that both enhances pretty images' appeal and erodes us viewers' own security in the face of gazes. Because of the way human beings relate to narrative, we tend to identify with those characters we find appealing. We try to see ourselves in them. The same ID relation, however, also means that we try to see them in ourselves. When everybody we seek to identify with for six hours a day is pretty, it naturally becomes more important to us to be pretty, to be viewed as pretty. Because prettiness becomes a priority for us, the pretty people on TV become all the more attractive, a cycle which is obviously great for TV. But it's less great for us civilians, who tend to own mirrors, and who also tend not to be anywhere near as pretty as the images we try to identify with. Not only does this cause some angst personally, the angst increases because, nationally, everybody else is absorbing six-hour doses and identifying with pretty people and valuing prettiness more, too. This very personal anxiety about our prettiness has become a national phenomenon with national consequences. The whole USA gets different about things it values and fears. The boom in diet aids, health and fitness clubs, neighborhood tanning parlors, cosmetic surgery, anorexia, bulimia, steroid use among boys, Girls throwing acid at each other because one girl's hair looks more like Farrah Fawcett's than another's. Are these supposed to be unrelated to each other? To the apotheosis of prettiness in a televisual culture? It's not paranoid or hysterical to acknowledge that television in large doses affects people's values and self-esteem in deep ways. That televisual conditioning influences the whole psychology of one's relation to himself, his mirror, his loved ones, and a world of real people in real gazes. No one's going to claim that a culture all about watching and appearing is fatally compromised by unreal standards of beauty and fitness. But other facets of TV training 
reveal themselves as more rapacious, more serious, than any irreverent fiction writer would want to take seriously. Irony's Aura It's widely recognized that television, with its horn-rimmed battery of statisticians and pollsters, is awfully good at discerning patterns in the flux of popular ideologies, absorbing them, processing them, and then representing them as persuasions to watch and to buy. Commercials targeted at the 80s upscale boomers, for example, are notorious for using processed versions of tunes from the rock culture of the 60s and 70s, both to elicit the yearning that accompanies nostalgia and to yoke purchases of products with what for yuppies is a lost era of genuine conviction. Ford sports vans are advertised with, this is the dawning of the age of the Aerostar. Ford recently litigates with Bette Midler over the theft of her old vocals on Do You Wanna Dance? Claymation raisins dance to Heard It Through the Grapevine, etc. If the commercial reuse of songs and the ideals they used to symbolize seems distasteful, it's not like pop musicians are paragons of non-commercialism themselves, and anyway, nobody ever said selling was pretty. The effects of any instance of TV absorbing and pablomizing cultural tokens seems innocuous, but the recycling of whole cultural trends and the ideologies that inform them are a different story. U.S. pop culture is just like U.S. serious culture, in that its central tension has always set the nobility of individualism on one side against the warmth of communal belonging on the other. For its first 20 or so years, it seemed as though television sought to appeal mostly to the group side of the equation. Communities and bonding were extolled on early TV, even though TV itself, and especially its advertising, has from the outset projected itself at the lone viewer, Joe Briefcase, alone. Television commercials always make their appeals to individuals, not groups, a fact that seems curious in light of the unprecedented size of TV's audience, until one hears gifted salesmen explain how people are always most vulnerable, hence frightened, hence needy, hence persuadable, when they are approached solo. Classic television commercials were all about the group. They took the vulnerability of Joe Briefcase, sitting there, watching, lonely, and capitalized it by linking purchase of a given product with Joe B's inclusion in some attractive community. This is why those of us over 21 can remember all those interchangeable old commercials featuring groups of pretty people in some ecstatic context, having just way more fun than anybody has a license to have, and all united as happy group by the conspicuous fact that they're holding a certain bottle of pop or brand of snack. And the blatant appeal here is that the relevant product can help Joe Briefcase belong. We're the Pepsi generation. But since, at least, the 80s, the individualist side of the great U.S. conversation has held sway in TV advertising. I'm not sure just why or how this happened. There are probably great connections to be traced, with Vietnam, youth cultures, Watergate and recession, and the new rights rise. But the relevant datum is that a lot of the most effective TV commercials now make their appeal to the lone viewer in a terribly different way. Products are now most often pitched as helping the viewer express himself, assert his individuality, stand out from the crowd. The first instance I ever saw was a perfume vividly billed in the early 80s as reacting specially with each woman's unique body chemistry and creating her own individual scent. The ad depicting a cattle line of languid models waiting cramped and expressionless to get their wrists squirted one at a time, each smelling her moist individual wrist with a kind of biochemical revelation, and then moving off in what a back pan reveals to be different directions from the squirter. We can ignore the obvious sexual connotations, squirting and all that, some tactics are changeless. Or think of that recent series of over-dreary, black-and-white, cherry 7-up ads, where the only characters who get to have color and stand out from their surroundings are the pink people, who become pink at the exact moment they imbibe. Examples of stand-apart ads are ubiquitous nightly now. Except for being sillier, products billed as distinguishing individuals from crowds sell to huge crowds of individuals. These ads aren't really any more complicated or subtle than the old join the fulfilling crowd ads that now seem so quaint. But the new standout ads relation to their chiroscuro mass of lone viewers is both complex and ingenious. 
Today's best ads are still about the group, but they now present the group as something fearsome, something that can swallow you up, erase you, keep you from being noticed. But noticed by whom? Crowds are still vitally important in the Stand Apart ad's thesis on identity, but now a given ad's crowd, far from being more appealing, secure, and alive than the individual, functions as a mass of identical featureless eyes. The crowd is now, paradoxically, both the herd, in contrast to which the viewer's distinctive identity is to be defined, and the impassive witnesses, whose sight alone can confer distinctive identity. The lone viewer's isolation in front of his furniture is implicitly applauded. It's better, realer, these solipsistic ads imply, to fly solo, and yet also implicated as threatening, confusing, since after all, Joe Briefcase is not an idiot, sitting here, and knows himself as a viewer to be guilty of the two big sins the ads decry, being a passive watcher of TV, and being a part of a great herd of TV watchers and stand-apart product buyers. How odd. The surface of stand-apart ads still presents a relatively unalloyed by this thing, but the deep message of television with respect to these ads looks to be that Joe Briefcase's ontological status as just one in a reactive watching mass is in a deep way false, and that true actualization of self would ultimately consist in Joe's becoming one of the images that are the objects of this great herd-like watching. That is, TV's real pitch in these commercials is that it's better to be inside the TV than to be outside, watching. The lonely grandeur of stand-apart advertising not only sells companies' products, then. It manages brilliantly to ensure, even in commercials that television gets paid to run, that ultimately TV, and not any specific product or service, will be regarded by Joe B. as the ultimate arbiter of human worth, an oracle to be consulted a lot. Advertising scholar Mark C. Miller puts it succinctly, TV has gone beyond the explicit celebration of commodities to the implicit reinforcement of that spectatorial posture which TV requires of us. Solipsistic ads are another way television ends up pointing at itself, keeping the viewer's relation to his furniture at once alienated and anaclytic. Maybe, though, the relation of contemporary viewer to contemporary TV is less a paradigm of infantilism and addiction than it is to the USA's familiar relation to all the technology we equate at once with freedom and power and slavery and chaos. For, as with TV, whether we happen personally to love technology, hate it, fear it, or all three, we still look relentlessly to technology for solutions to the very problems technology seems to cause. Catalysis for smog, SDI for missiles, transplants for assorted rot. And as with tech, so the gestalt of TV expands to absorb all problems associated with it. The pseudo-communities of primetime soaps like Knott's Landing and 30-something are viewer-soothing products of the very medium whose ambivalence about groups helps erode people's sense of connection. The staccato editing, sound bites, and summary treatment of naughty issues is network news accommodation of an audience whose attention span and appetite for complexity have atrophied a bit after years of high-dose spectation, etc. But TV has tech-bred problems of its own. The advent of cable, often with packages of over 40 channels, threatens networks and local affiliates alike. This is particularly true when the viewer is armed with a remote control gizmo. Joe B. is still getting his six hours total of daily TV, but the amount of his retinal time devoted to any one option shrinks, as he remote scans a much wider band. Worse, the VCR, with its dreaded fast-forward and zap functions, threatens the very viability of commercials. Television advertisers' sensible solution? Make the ads as appealing as the shows. Or, at any rate, try to keep Joe from disliking the commercials enough so that he's willing to move his thumb to check out two and a half minutes of Hazel on the Superstation while NBC sells lip balm. Make the ads prettier, livelier, full of enough rapidly juxtaposed visual quanta that Joe's attention just doesn't get to wander, even if he remote kills the volume. As one ad executive underputs it, commercials are becoming more like entertaining films. There's an obverse way to make commercials resemble programs. Have programs start to resemble commercials. That way, 
The ads seem less like interruptions than like pace setters, metronomes, commentaries on the show's theory. Invent a Miami Vice, where there's little annoying plot to interrupt an unprecedented emphasis on appearances, visuals, attitude, a certain look. Make music videos with the same amphetaminic pace and dreamy archetypal associations as ads. It doesn't hurt that videos are basically long record commercials anyway. Or introduce the sponsor-supplied infomercial that poses, in a light-hearted way, as a soft news show, like Amazing Discoveries, or those Robert Vaughn-hosted hair loss reports that haunt TV's wee cheap hours. Still, television and its commercial sponsors had a bigger long-term worry, and that was their shaky detente with the individual viewer's psyche. Given that television must revolve off antinomies about being and watching, about escape from daily life, the averagely intelligent viewer can't be all that happy about his daily life of high-dose watching. Joe Briefcase might be happy enough when watching, but it was hard to think he could be too terribly happy about watching so much. Surely, deep down, Joe was uncomfortable with being one part of the biggest crowd in human history, watching images that suggest that life's meaning consists in standing visibly apart from the crowd. TV's guilt, indulgence, reassurance cycle addresses these concerns on one level. But might there not be some deeper way to keep Joe Briefcase firmly in the crowd of watchers by somehow associating his very viewership with transcendence of watching crowds. But that would be absurd. Enter irony. I've said, so far without support, that what makes television's hegemony so resistant to critique by the new fiction of image is that TV has co-opted the distinctive forms of the same cynical, irreverent, ironic, absurdist post-World War II literature that the imagists use as touchstones. TV's own reuse of postmodern cool has actually evolved as a grimly inspired solution to the keep Joe at once alienated from and part of the million-eyed crowd problem. The solution entailed a gradual shift from oversincerity to a kind of bad boy irreverence in the big face TV shows us. This in turn reflected a wider shift in US perceptions of how art was supposed to work a transition from arts being a creative instantiation of real values to arts being a creative instantiation of deviance from bogus values. And this wider shift, in its turn, paralleled both the development of the postmodern aesthetic and some deep philosophic change in how Americans chose to view concepts like authority, sincerity, and passion in terms of our willingness to be pleased. Not only are sincerity and passion now out, TV-wise, but the very idea of pleasure has been undercut. As Mark C. Miller puts it, contemporary television, quote, no longer solicits our rapt absorption or hearty agreement, but, like the ads that subsidize it, actually flatters us for the very boredom and distrust it inspires in us, end quote. Miller's 1986 Deride and Conquer, the best essay ever written on network advertising, details vividly an example of how TV's contemporary appeal to the lone viewer works. It concerns a 1985-86 ad that won Cleos and still occasionally runs. It's that Pepsi commercial, where a Pepsi sound van pulls up to a packed, sweltering beach, and the impish young guy in the van activates a lavish PA system and opens up a Pepsi and pours it into a cup next to the microphone and the dense, glittered sound of much carbonation goes out over the beach's heat-wrinkled air, and heads turn vanward, as if pulled with strings as his gulp and refreshed, sparenty sounds are broadcast, and the final shot reveals that the sound van is also a concession truck, and the whole beach's pretty population has collapsed to a clamoring mass around the truck, everybody hopping up and down and pleading to be served first, as the camera's view retreats to overhead, and the slogan is flatly intoned. Pepsi, the choice of a new generation. Really a stunning commercial, but need one point out, as Miller does at length, that the final slogan is here tongue-in-cheek? There's about as much choice at work in this commercial as there was in Pavlov's bell kennel. In fact, the whole 30-second spot is tongue-in-cheek, ironic, self-mocking. As Miller argues, it's not really choice that the commercial is selling Joe Briefcase on, but the total negation of choices. Indeed, the product itself is finally incidental to the pitch. 
The ad does not so much extol Pepsi per se, as recommend it by implying that a lot of people have been fooled into buying it. In other words, the point of this successful bit of advertising is that Pepsi has been advertised successfully. There are important things to realize here. First, this ad is deeply informed by a fear of remote gizmos, zapping, and viewer disdain. An ad about ads, it uses self-reference to seem too hip to hate. It protects itself from the scorn today's viewing cognizant feels for both the fast-talking hard-sell ads Dan Aykroyd parodied into oblivion on Saturday Night Live, and the quixotic associative ads that linked soda drinking with romance, prettiness, and group inclusion. Ads today's jaded viewer finds old-fashioned and manipulative. In contrast to a blatant buy this thing, this Pepsi commercial pitches parody. The ad's utterly upfront about what TV ads are popularly despised for doing, using primal flim-flam appeals to sell sugary crud to people whose identity is nothing but mass consumption. This ad manages simultaneously to make fun of itself, Pepsi, advertising, advertisers, and the great US watching, consuming crowd. In fact, the ad's uxorious in its flattery of only one person, the lone viewer, Joe B., who, even with an average brain, can't help but discern the ironic contradiction between the choice slogan, sound, and the Pavlovian orgy, sight. The commercial invites Joe to see through the manipulation the Beach's horde is rapidly buying. The commercial invites complicity between its own witty irony and veteran viewer Joe's cynical, nobody's fool appreciation of that irony. It invites Joe into an in-joke the audience is the butt of. It congratulates Joe Briefcase, in other words, on transcending the very crowd that defines him here. This ad boosted Pepsi's market share through three sales quarters. Pepsi's campaign is not unique. Isuzu Incorporated hit pay dirt with its series of Joe Isuzu spots, featuring an oily, satanic-looking salesman who told Whoppers about Isuzu's genuine llama skin upholstery and ability to run on tap water. Though the ads rarely said much of anything about why Isuzu's are in fact good cars, sales and awards accrued. The ads succeeded as parodies of how oily and satanic car commercials are. They invited viewers to congratulate Isuzu ads for being ironic, to congratulate themselves for getting the joke, and to congratulate Isuzu Incorporated for being fearless and irreverent enough to acknowledge that car ads are ridiculous and that the audience is dumb to believe them. The ads invite the lone viewer to drive an Isuzu as some sort of anti-advertising statement. The ads successfully associate Isuzu purchase with fearlessness and irreverence and the capacity to see through deception. You can find successful television ads that mock TV ad conventions almost anywhere you look, from Settlemeyer's Federal Express and Wendy's Spots, with their wizened, sped-up burlesques of commercial characters, to those hip Doritos splices of commercial spokesmen and campy old clips of Beaver and Mr. Ed. Plus, you can see this tactic of heaping scorn on pretensions to those old commercial virtues of authority and sincerity, thus, one, shielding the heaper of scorn from scorn, and two, congratulating the patron of scorn for rising above the mass of people who still fall for outmoded pretensions. Employed to serious advantage, on many of the television programs the commercials support. Show after show, for years now, has been either a self-acknowledged, blank, visual, postmodern illusion and attitude fest, or even more common, an uneven battle of wits between some ineffectual spokesman for hollow authority and his precocious children, mordant spouse, or sardonic colleagues. Compare television's treatment of earnest authority figures on pre-ironic shows, the FBI's Erskine, Star Trek's Kirk, Beaver's Ward, Partridge Family's Shirley, Five O's McGarrett, to TV's depiction of Al Bundy on Married with Children, Mr. Owens on Mr. Belvedere, Homer on The Simpsons, Daniels and Hunter on Hill Street Blues, Jason Seaver on Growing Pains, Dr. Craig on Saint Elsewhere. The modern sitcom, in particular, is almost wholly dependent for laughs and tone on the mash-inspired savaging of some buffoonish spokesman for hypocritical, pre-hip values at the hands of bitingly witty insurgents. As Hawkeye savaged Frank and later Charles, 
So Herb is savaged by Jennifer and Carlson by Jay Fever on WKRP. Mr. Keaton by Alex on Family Ties. Boss by Typing Pool on 9 to 5. Seaver by Whole Family on Pains. Bundy by Entire Planet on Married With, the ultimate sitcom parody of sitcoms. In fact, just about the only authority figures who retain any credibility on post-80s shows, besides those like Hill Street's Ferrillo and St. Elsewhere's Westfall, who are surrounded by such relentless squalor that simply hanging in there a week after week makes them heroic, are those upholders of values who can communicate some irony about themselves, make fun of themselves before any merciless group around them can move in for the kill. See Huxtable on Cosby, Belvedere on Belvedere, Twin Peaks' Special Agent Cooper, Fox TV's Gary Shandling. The theme to whose show goes, this is the theme to Gary's show. And the ironic 80s true angel of death, D. Letterman. Its promulgation of cynicism about all authority works to the general advantage of television on a number of levels. First, to the extent that TV can ridicule old-fashioned conventions right off the map, it can create an authority vacuum. And then, guess what fills it? The real authority on a world we now view as constructed and not depicted becomes the medium that constructs our worldview. Second, to the extent that TV can refer exclusively to itself and debunk conventional standards as hollow, it is invulnerable to critics' charges that what's on is shallow or crass or bad, since any such judgments appeal to conventional, extra-televisual standards about depth, taste, and quality. Two, the ironic tone of TV's self-reference means that no one can accuse TV of trying to put anything over on anybody. As essayist Lewis Hyde points out, all self-mocking irony is sincerity with a motive. And, more to the original point, if television can invite Joe Briefcase into itself via in-gags and irony, it can ease that painful tension between Joe's need to transcend the crowd and his status as audience member. For to the extent that TV can flatter Joe about seeing through, the pretentiousness and hypocrisy of outdated values, it can induce in him precisely the feeling of canny superiority it's taught him to crave, and can keep him dependent on the cynical TV watching that alone affords this feeling. And to the extent that it can train viewers to laugh at characters' unending put-downs of another, to view ridicule as both the mode of social intercourse and the ultimate art form, television can reinforce its own queer ontology of appearance. The most frightening prospect for the well-conditioned viewer becomes leaving oneself open to others' ridicule by betraying passé expressions of value, emotion, or vulnerability. Other people become judges. The crime is naivete. The well-trained lonely viewer becomes even more allergic to other people. Lonelier. Joe B.'s exhaustive TV training in how to worry about how he might come across, seem, to other eyes, makes riskily genuine human encounters seem even scarier. But televisual irony has the solution to the problem it's aggravated. Further viewing begins to seem almost like required research. Lessons in the blank, bored, too wise expression that Joe must learn how to wear for tomorrow's excruciating ride on the brightly lit subway, where crowds of blank, bored-looking people have little to look at but each other. What does TV's institutionalization of hip irony have to do with U.S. fiction? Well, for one thing, American literary fiction tends to be about U.S. culture and the people who inhabit it. Culture-wise, shall I spend much of your time pointing out the degree to which televisual values influence the contemporary mood of jaded Welchmerts, self-mocking materialism, blank indifference, and the delusion that cynicism and naivete are mutually exclusive? Can we deny connections between an unprecedentedly powerful consensual medium that suggests no real difference between image and substance and the rise of Teflon presidencies, the establishment of nationwide tanning and liposuction industries, the popularity of voguing to a bad Marilyn imitator's synthesized command to strike a pose? Or, in serious contemporary art, that televisual disdain for hypocritical retro-values like originality, depth, and integrity has no truck with those recombinant appropriation styles of art and architecture in which past becomes pastiche, or with the tuneless solmization of a glass or a Reich. 
or with the self-conscious catatonia of a platoon of Raymond Carver wannabes. In fact, the numb, blank, bored demeanor, what my best friend calls the girl who's dancing with you but would obviously rather be dancing with somebody else expression, that has become my generation's version of cool, is all about TV. Television, after all, literally means seeing far, and our six hours daily not only helps us feel up close and personal at, like, the Pan Am Games or Operation Desert Shield, but, obversely, trains us to see real-life, personal, up-close stuff the same way we relate to the distant and exotic, as if separated from us by physics and glass, extant only as performance, awaiting our cooler review. Indifference is actually just the contemporary version of frugality, for U.S. young people, wooed several gorgeous hours a day for nothing but our attention. We regard that attention as our chief commodity, our social capital, and we are loath to fritter it. In the same regard, see that in 1990, flatness, numbness, and cynicism in one's demeanor are clear ways to transmit the televisual attitude of standout transcendence. Flatness is a transcendence of melodrama, numbness transcends sentimentality, and cynicism announces that one knows the score, was last naive about something at maybe like age four. Whether or not 1990s youth culture seems as grim to you as it does to me, Surely we can agree that the culture's TV-defined pop ethic has pulled a marvelous touché on the postmodern aesthetic that originally sought to co-opt and redeem the pop. Television has pulled the old dynamics of reference and redemption inside out. It is now television that takes elements of the postmodern, the involution, the absurdity, the sardonic fatigue, the iconoclasm and rebellion, and bends them to the ends of spectation and consumption. As early as 84, Critics of capitalism were warning that what began as a mood of the avant-garde has surged into mass culture. But postmodernism didn't just all of a sudden surge into television in 1984, nor have the vectors of influence between the postmodern and the televisual been one way. The chief connection between today's television and today's fiction is historical. The two share roots. For postmodern fiction, written almost exclusively by young white males, clearly evolved as an intellectual expression of the rebellious youth culture of the 60s and early 70s. And since the whole gestalt of youthful U.S. rebellion was made possible by a national medium that erased communicative boundaries between regions and replaced a society segmented by location and ethnicity with what rock music critics have called a national self-consciousness stratified by generation, the phenomenon of TV had as much to do with postmodernism's rebellious irony as it did with Peacenik's protest rallies. In fact, by offering young, overeducated fiction writers a comprehensive view of how hypocritically the USA saw itself circa 1960, early television helped legitimize absurdism and irony as not just literary devices, but sensible responses to an unrealistic world. For irony, exploiting gaps between what's said and what's meant, between how things try to appear and how they really are, is the time-honored way artists seek to illuminate and explode hypocrisy. And the television of lone gunman westerns, paternalistic sitcoms, and jut-jawed law enforcement circa 1960 celebrated a deeply hypocritical American self-image. Miller describes nicely how the 1960s sitcom, like the westerns that preceded them, quote, negated the increasing powerlessness of white-collar males with images of paternal strength and manly individualism. Yet, by the time these sitcoms were produced, the world of small business, whose virtues were the Hugh Beaumontish ones of self-possession, probity, and sound judgment, had long since been superseded by what C. Wright Mills called the managerial demiurge, and the virtues personified by Dad were in fact passé." End quote. In other words, early U.S. TV was a hypocritical apologist for values whose reality had become attenuated in a period of corporate ascendancy, bureaucratic entrenchment, foreign adventurism, racial conflict, secret bombing, assassination, wiretaps, etc. It's not one bit accidental that postmodern fiction aimed its ironic crosshairs at the banal, the naive, the sentimental and simplistic and conservative, for these qualities were just what 60s TV seemed to celebrate as American. 
And the rebellious irony in the best postmodern fiction wasn't only credible as art. It seemed downright socially useful in its capacity for what counterculture critics call a critical negation that would make itself evident to everyone that the world is not as it seems. Kesey's dark parody of asylums suggested that our arbiters of sanity were maybe crazier than their patients. Pynchon reoriented our view of paranoia from deviant psychic fringe to central thread in the corporo-bureaucratic weave. DeLillo exposed image, signal, data, and tech as agents of spiritual chaos and not social order. Burroughs' icky explorations of American narcosis exploded hypocrisy. Gaddis's exposure of abstract capital as dehumanizing exploded hypocrisy. Coover's repulsive political farces exploded hypocrisy. Irony in 60s art and culture started out the same way youthful rebellion did. It was difficult and painful and productive. A grim diagnosis of a long-denied disease. The assumptions behind this early postmodern irony, on the other hand, were still frankly idealistic. That etiology and diagnosis pointed towards cure. That revelation of imprisonment yielded freedom. So then how have irony, irreverence, and rebellion come to be not liberating but enfeebling in the culture today's avant-garde tries to write about? One clue is to be found in the fact that irony is still around, bigger than ever after 30 long years as the dominant mode of hip expression. It's not a mode that wears especially well. As Hyde puts it, irony has only emergency use. Carried over time, it is the voice of the trapped who have come to enjoy their cage. This is because irony, entertaining as it is, serves an exclusively negative function. It's critical and destructive, a ground clearing. Surely this is the way our postmodern fathers saw it. But irony is singularly unuseful when it comes to constructing anything to replace the hypocrisies it debunks. This is why Hyde seems right about persistent irony being tiresome. It's unmeaty. Even gifted ironists work best in sound bites. I find them sort of wickedly fun to listen to at parties, but I always walk away feeling like I've had several radical surgical procedures. And as for actually driving cross-country with a gifted ironist, or sitting through a 300-page novel full of nothing but trendy sardonic exhaustion, one ends up feeling not only empty, but somehow oppressed. Think, if you will for a moment, of third world rebels and coups. Rebels are great at exposing and overthrowing corrupt hypocritical regimes, but seem notably less great at the mundane, non-negative tasks of then establishing a superior governing alternative. Victorious rebels, in fact, seem best at using their tough cynical rebel skills to avoid being rebelled against themselves. In other words, they just become better tyrants. And make no mistake, irony tyrannizes us. The reason why our pervasive cultural irony is at once so powerful and so unsatisfying is that an ironist is impossible to pin down. All irony is a variation on a sort of existential poker face. All US irony is based on an implicit, I don't really mean what I say. So what does irony as a cultural norm mean to say? That it's impossible to mean what you say? That maybe it's too bad it's impossible, but wake up and smell the coffee already? Most likely, I think today's irony ends up saying, how very banal to ask what I mean. Anyone with the heretical gall to ask an ironist what he actually stands for ends up looking like a hysteric or a prig. And herein lies the oppressiveness of institutionalized irony, the too successful rebel, the ability to interdict the question without attending to its content is tyranny. It is the new junta, using the very tool that exposed its enemy to insulate itself. This is why our educated teleholic friend's use of weary cynicism to try to seem superior to TV is so pathetic. And this is why the fiction writing citizen of our televisual culture is in such deep do. What do you do when postmodern rebellion becomes a pop cultural institution? For this, of course, is the second clue to why avant-garde irony and rebellion have become dilute and malign. They have been absorbed, emptied, and redeployed by the very televisual establishment they had originally set themselves athwart. Not that television is culpable for true evil here, just for immoderate success. 
This is, after all, what TV does. It discerns, decocts, and represents what it thinks U.S. culture wants to see and hear about itself. No one, and everyone, is at fault for the fact that television started gleaning rebellion and cynicism as the hip, upscale, baby-boomer imago populi. But the harvest has been dark. The forms of our best rebellious art have become mere gestures, shticks, not only sterile, but perversely enslaving. How can even the idea of rebellion against corporate culture stay meaningful when Chrysler Incorporated advertises trucks by invoking the Dodge Rebellion? How is one to be a bona fide iconoclast when Burger King sells onion rings with sometimes you gotta break the rules? How can a new image fiction writer hope to make people more critical of televisual culture by parodying television as a self-serving commercial enterprise when Pepsi and Isuzu and FedEx Parodies of self-serving commercials are already big business. It's almost a history lesson. I'm starting to see just why turn-of-the-century America's biggest fear was of anarchists and anarchy. For if anarchy actually wins, if rulelessness becomes the rule, then protest and change become not just impossible, but incoherent. It'd be like casting ballots for Stalin. How do you vote for no more voting? So here's the stumper for the 1990 U.S. fictionist who both breathes our cultural atmosphere and sees himself heir to whatever was neat and valuable in postmodern lit. How to rebel against TV's aesthetic of rebellion. How to snap readers awake to the fact that our TV culture has become a cynical, narcissistic, essentially empty phenomenon when television regularly celebrates just these features in itself and its viewers. These are the very questions DeLillo's poor schmuck of a popologist was asking back in 85 about America, that most photographed of barns. Quote, What was the barn like before it was photographed, he said. What did it look like? How was it different from other barns? How was it similar to other barns? We can't answer these questions because we've read the signs, seen the people snapping the pictures. We can't get outside the aura. We're part of the aura. We're here. We're now. He seemed immensely pleased by this." End, quote. end of the end of the line. What responses to television's commercialization of the modes of literary protest seem possible then, today? One obvious option is for the fiction writer to become reactionary, fundamentalist. Declare temporary television evil, and contemporary culture evil, and turn one's back on the whole spandexed mess and genuflect instead to good old pre-sixties Hugh Beaumontish virtues and literal readings of the Testaments and be pro-life, anti-fluoride, antediluvian. The problem with this is that Americans who've opted for this tack seem to have one eyebrow straight across their forehead and knuckles that drag on the ground and just seem like an excellent crowd to want to transcend. Besides, their eyes of Reagan Bush showed that hypocritical nostalgia for a kinder, gentler, more Christian pseudo-past is no less susceptible to manipulation in the interests of corporate commercialism and PR image. Most of us will still take nihilism over Neanderthalism. Another option is to adapt to somewhat more enlightened political conservatism that exempts the viewer and networks alike from any complicity in the bitter stasis of televisual culture, and instead blames all TV-related problems on certain correctable defects in broadcasting technology. Enter media futurologist George Gilder, a Hudson Institute senior fellow and author of 1990's Life After Television, The Coming Transformation of Media and American Life. The single most fascinating thing about Life After Television is that it's a book with commercials. Published in something called The Larger Agenda Series by a Whittle Direct Books in Federal Express Incorporated's Knoxville headquarters, the book sells for only $11 hard, including postage, is big and thin enough to look great on executive coffee tables, and has really pretty full-page ads for Federal Express on every fifth page. The book's also largely a work of fiction, plus is a heart-rending dramatization of why anti-TV conservatives, motivated by simple convictions like television is at heart a totalitarian medium, whose system is an alien and corrosive force in democratic capitalism, are going to be of little help with our ultra-radical TV problems, 
attached as conservative intellectuals still are to their twin tired remedies for all U.S. ills. The beliefs that, one, the discerning consumer instincts of the little guy would correct all imbalances if only big systems would quit stifling his freedom to choose, and that, two, tech-bred problems can be resolved technologically. Gilder's basic report and forecast runs thus. Television as we know and suffer it is a technology with supreme powers but deadly flaws. The really fatal flaw is that the whole structure of television programming, broadcasting, and reception is still informed by the technological limitations of the old vacuum tubes that first enabled TV. The expense and complexity of these tubes used in television sets meant that most of the processing of signals would have to be done at the networks, a state of affairs that dictated that television would be a top-down system, in electronic terms, a master-slave architecture. A few broadcasting centers would originate programs for millions of passive receivers, or dumb terminals. By the time the transistor, which does essentially what vacuum tubes do but in less space at lower cost, found commercial applications, the top-down TV system was already entrenched and petrified, dooming viewers to docile reception of programs they were dependent on a very few networks to provide, and creating a psychology of the masses, in which a trio of programming alternatives aimed to appeal to millions and millions of Joe B's. The passive plight of the viewer was aggravated by the fact that the EM pulses used to broadcast TV signals are analog waves. Analogs were once the required medium, since, with little storage or processing available at the set, the signals would have to be directly displayable waves, and analog waves directly simulate sound, brightness, and color. But analog waves can't be saved or edited by their recipient. They're too much like life. They're in gorgeous toto one instant, and then gone. What the poor TV viewer gets is only what he sees, with cultural consequences Gilder describes in apocalyptic detail. Even high-definition television, HDTV, touted by the industry as the next big advancement in entertainment furniture, will, according to Gilder, be just the same vacuous emperor in a snazzier suit. But in 1990, TV, still clinging to the crowd-binding and hierarchical technologies of yesterdecade, is for Gilder now doomed by the advances in microchip and fiber-optic technology of the last couple years. The user-friendly microchip which consolidates the activities of millions of transistors on one 49-cent wafer, and whose capacities will get even more attractive as controlled electron conduction approaches the geodesic paradigm of efficiency, will allow receivers, TV sets, to do much of the image processing that has hitherto been done for the viewer by the broadcaster. In another happy development, transporting images through glass fibers rather than the EM spectrum will allow people's TV sets to be hooked up with each other in a kind of interactive net instead of all feeding passively at the transmitting teat of a single broadcaster. And fiber optic transmissions have the further advantage that they conduct characters of information digitally. Since digital signals have an advantage over analog signals in that they can be stored and manipulated without deterioration, as well as being crisp and interferenceless as quality CDs, they'll allow the microchipped television receiver and thus the TV viewer, to enjoy much of the discretion over selection, manipulation, and recombination of video images that is now restricted to the director's booth. For Gilder, the new piece of furniture that will free Joe Briefcase from passive dependence on his furniture will be the telecomputer, a personal computer adapted for video processing and connected by fiber optic threads to other telecomputers around the world. The fibrous TC will forever break the broadcast bottleneck, of television's one active, many passive structure of image propagation. Now, everybody'll get to be his own harried guy with headphones and clipboard. In the new millennium, US television will finally become, ideally, gopishly democratic, egalitarian, interactive, and profitable without being exploitative. Boy, does Gilder know his larger agenda audience. You can just see saliva overflowing lower lips in boardrooms as Gilder forecasts that the consumer's whole complicated, fuzzy, inconveniently transient world will become broadcastable, manipulable, storable, and viewable in the comfort of his own condo. With artful programming of telecomputers, you could spend a day interacting on the screen with Henry Kissinger, Kim Basinger, or Billy Graham. 
rather ghastly interactions to contemplate, but then in Gilderland, to each his own. Celebrities could produce and sell their own software. You could view the Super Bowl from any point in the stadium you choose, or soar above the basket with Michael Jordan. Visit your family on the other side of the world with moving pictures hardly distinguishable from real-life images. Give a birthday party for Grandma in her nursing home in Florida, bringing her descendants from all over the country to the foot of her bed in living color. And not just warm 2D images of family. Any experience will be transferable to image and marketable, manipulable, consumable. People will be able to go comfortably sightseeing from their living room through high-resolution screens, visiting third-world countries without having to worry about airfare or exchange rates. You could fly an airplane over the Alps or climb Mount Everest, all on a powerful high-resolution display. We will, in short, be able to engineer our own dreams. In sum, then, a conservative tech writer offers a really attractive way of looking at viewer passivity and TV's institutionalization of irony, narcissism, nihilism, stasis. It's not our fault. It's outmoded technology's fault. If TV dissemination were up to date, it would be impossible for it to institutionalize anything through its demonic mass psychology. Let's let Joe B., the little lonely guy, be his own manipulator of video bits. Once all experience is finally reduced to marketable image, once the receiving user of user-friendly receivers can choose freely, Americanly, from an Americanly infinite variety of moving images hardly distinguishable from real-life images, and can then choose further just how he wishes to store, enhance, edit, recombine, and present these images to himself in the privacy of his very own home and skull, TV's ironic, totalitarian grip on the American psychic cojones will be broken. Note that Gilder's semiconducted vision of a free, orderly video future is way more upbeat than postmodernism's old view of image and data. The seminal novels of Pynchon and DeLillo revolve metaphorically off the concept of interference. The more connections, the more chaos, and the harder it is to cull any meaning from the seas of signal. Gilder would call their gloom outmoded, their metaphor infected with the deficiencies of the transistor. In all networks of wires and switches, except for those on the microchip, complexity tends to grow exponentially as the number of interconnections rises. But in the silicon maze of microchip technology, efficiency, not complexity, grows as the square of the number of interconnections to be organized. Rather than a vacuous TV culture smothering in cruddy images, Gilder foresees TC culture redeemed by a whole lot more to choose from, and a whole lot more control over what you choose to, um, see? Pseudo-experience? Dream? It'd be unrealistic to think that expanded choices alone could resolve our televisual bind. The advent of cable upped choices from 4 or 5 to 40-plus synchronic alternatives with little apparent loosening of television's grip on mass attitudes and aesthetics. It seems, rather, that Gilder sees the 90s impending breakthrough as U.S. viewers' graduation from passive reception of facsimiles of experience to active manipulation of facsimiles of experience. It's worth questioning Gilder's definition of televisual passivity, though. His new tech would indeed end the passivity of mere reception, but the passivity of audience, the acquiescence inherent in a whole culture of and about watching, looks unaffected by TCs. The appeal of watching television has always involved fantasy. Contemporary TV, I've claimed, has gotten vastly better at enabling the viewer's fantasy that he can transcend the limitations of individual human experience, that he can be inside the set, imagoed, anyone, anywhere. Since the limitations of being one human being involve certain restrictions on the number of different experiences possible to us in a given period of time, it's arguable that the biggest TV tech advances of recent years have done little but abet this fantasy of escape from the defining limits of being human. Cable expands our choices of evening realities, Handheld gizmos let us leap instantly from one to another. VCRs let us commit experiences to an eidetic memory that permits re-experience at any time, without loss or alteration. These advances sold briskly and upped average viewing doses, but they sure haven't made U.S. televisual culture any less passive or cynical. The downside of TV's big fantasy is that it's just a fantasy. As a special treat, my escape from the limits of genuine experience is neato. As my steady diet, though, 
it can't help but render my own reality less attractive, because in it I'm just one Dave, with limits and restrictions all over the place. Render me less fit to make the most of it, because I spend all my time pretending I'm not in it, and render me dependent on the device that affords escape from just what my escapism makes unpleasant. It's tough to see how Gilder's soteriological vision of having more control over the arrangement of high-quality fantasy bits is going to ease either the dependency that is part of my relation to TV, or the impotent irony I must use to pretend I'm not dependent. Whether passive or active as viewer, I must still cynically pretend because I'm still dependent. Because my real dependency here is not on the single show or few networks any more than the Hopheads is on the Turkish florist or the Marseilles refiner. My real dependency is on the fantasies and the images that enable them, and thus on any technology that can make images fantastic. Make no mistake, we are dependent on image technology, and the better the tech, the harder we're hooked. The paradox in Gilder's rosy forecast is the same as in all forms of artificial enhancement. The more enhancing the mediation, see for instance binoculars, amplifiers, graphic equalizers, or high-resolution pictures hardly distinguishable from real-life images, the more direct, vivid, and real the experience seems, which is to say the more direct, vivid, and real the fantasy and dependence are. An exponential surge in the mass of televisual images, and a commensurate increase in my ability to cut, paste, magnify, and combine them to suit my own fancy, can do nothing but render my interactive TC a more powerful enhancer and enabler of fantasy, my attraction to that fantasy stronger, the real experiences of which my TC offers more engaging and controllable simulacra, paler and more frustrating to deal with, and me just a whole lot more dependent on my furniture. Jacking the number of choices and options up with better tech will remedy exactly nothing, so long as no sources of insight on comparative worth, no guides to why and how to choose among experiences, fantasies, beliefs, and predilections are permitted serious consideration in U.S. culture. Insights and guides to human value used to be among literature's jobs, didn't they? But then, who's going to want to take such stuff seriously in ecstatic post-TV life, with Kim Basinger waiting to be interacted with? My god, I've just reread my heartfelt criticisms of Gilder, that he is naive, that he is an apologist for cynical corporate self-interest, that his book has commercials, that under its futuristic novelty is just the same old American same old that got us into this televisual mess, that Gilder vastly underestimates the intractability of the mess, its hopelessness, our fatigue. My attitude, reading Gilder, is sardonic, aloof, jaded. My reading of Gilder is televisual. I am in the aura. Well, but at least Gilder is unironic. In this respect, he's like a cool summer breeze compared to Mark Lehner, the young New Jersey writer whose 1990 My Cousin, My Gastroenterologist is the biggest thing for campus hipsters since the Dharma Bums. Lehner's ironic cyberpunk novel exemplifies a third kind of literary response to our problem. For, of course, young U.S. writers can resolve the problem of being trapped in the televisual aura the same way French post-structuralists resolve their being enmeshed in the logos. We can solve the problem by celebrating it. Transcend feelings of mass-defined angst by genuflecting to them. We can be reverently ironic. My cousin, my gastroenterologist, is new not so much in kind as in degree. It is a methadrine compound of pop pastiche, offhand high-tech, and dazzling televisual parody, formed with surreal juxtapositions and grammarless monologues and flash-cut editing, and framed with a relentless irony designed to make its frantic tone seem irreverent instead of repulsive. You want send-ups of commercial culture? Quote, I had just been fired from McDonald's for refusing to wear a kilt during production launch week for their new McHaggis sandwich. He picks up a copy of Das Plumpe Denken, New England's most disreputable German-language news magazine. Blast in egg cream factory kills philatelist. He turns the page. Radioactive glow-in-the-dark semen found in Canada. He turns the page. Modern-day Hottentots carry young in resealable sandwich bags. He turns the page. Wayne Newton calls mother's womb single occupancy Garden of Eden. Morgan Fairchild calls Sally Struthers Loney Anderson. What color is your mozzarella? I asked the waitress. It's pink, 
It's the same color as the top of a men and lady speed stick dispenser. You know that color? No, ma'am, I said. It's the same color they use for Gillette Daisy Disposable Razors for Women. You know that color? No. Well, it's the same pink as Pepto-Bismol. You know that color? Oh yeah, I said. Well, do you have spaghetti? End quote. You want mordant send-ups of television? Quote. Muriel got the TV guide, flipped to Tuesday, 8 p.m., and read aloud. There is a show called A Tumult of Pubic Hair and Bobbing Flaccid Penises as Sweaty Naked Chubby Men Run from the Sauna Screaming Snake! Snake! It also stars Brian Keith, Buddy Ebsen, Nipsey Russell, and Leslie Ann Warren. End quote. You like mocking self-reference? The novel's whole last chapter is a parody of its own About the Author page, or Maybe You're Into Hip Identitylessness. Quote, Grandma rolled up a magazine and hit Buzz on the side of the head. Buzz's mask was knocked loose. There was no skin beneath that mask. There were two white eyeballs protruding on stems from a mass of oozing blood-red musculature. I can't tell if she's human, or a fifth-generation gynomorphic android, and I don't care. End quote. Parodic meditations on the boundaryless flux of televisual monoculture? Quote, I'm stirring a pitcher of Tancore martinis with one hand, and sliding a tray of frozen clams oreganata into the oven with my foot. God, these methadrin suppositories that Yogi Vithaldis gave me are good. As I iron a pair of tennis shorts, I dictate a haiku into the tape recorder, and then do three minutes on the speed bag before making an origami praying mantis, and then reading an article in High Fidelity magazine as I stir the cocovin. End quote. The decay of both the limits and the integrity of the single human self? Quote, there was a woman with the shrunken, wrinkled face of an 80 or 90 year old, and this withered hag, this apparent octogenarian, had the body of a male Olympic swimmer, the long, lean, sinewy arms, the powerful V-shaped upper torso without a single ounce of fat. To install your replacement head, place the head assembly on neck housing and insert guide pins through mounting holes. If, after installing new head, you are unable to discern the contradictions in capitalist modes of production, you have either installed your head improperly or head is defective. End quote. In fact, one of my cousin, my gastroenterologist's unifying obsessions is this latter juxtaposition of parts of selves, people and machines, human subjects and discrete objects. Lehner's fiction is, in this regard, an eloquent reply to Gilder's prediction that our TV culture problems can be resolved by the dismantling of images into discrete chunks that we can recombine as we fancy. Lehner's world is a Gilder-esque dystopia. The passivity and schizoid decay still endure for Lehner in his character's reception of images and waves of data. The ability to combine them only adds a layer of disorientation. When all experience can be deconstructed and reconfigured, there become simply too many choices. And in the absence of any credible, non-commercial guides for living, the freedom to choose is about as liberating as a bad acid trip. Each quantum is as good as the next, and the only standard of an assembly's quality is its weirdness, incongruity, its ability to stand out from a crowd of other image constructs and wow some audience. Lehner's novel, in its amphetaminic eagerness to wow the reader, marks the far dark frontier of the fiction of image, Literature is absorption of not just the icons, techniques, and phenomena of television, but of television's whole objective. My cousin, my gastroenterologist's sole aim is, finally, to wow, to ensure that the reader is pleased and continues to read. The book does this by, one, flattering the reader with appeals to his erudite postmodern Weltschmerz, and two, relentlessly reminding the reader that the author is smart and funny. The book itself is extremely funny, but it's not funny the way funny stories are funny. It's not that funny things happen here, it's that funny things are self-consciously imagined and pointed out, like the comedian's stock, you ever notice how, or ever wonder what would happen if... Actually, Lehner's whole high imagist style most often resembles a kind of lapidary stand-up comedy, quote, Suddenly, Bob couldn't speak properly. He had suffered some form of spontaneous aphasia. But it wasn't total aphasia. He could speak, but only in a staccato telegraphic style. Here's how he described driving through the Midwest on Interstate 80. Corn, 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 stuckies, corn, 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 stuckies. 
There is a bar on the highway which caters almost exclusively to authority figures, and the only drink it serves is light beer, and the only food it serves is surf and turf, and the place is filled with cops and state troopers and gym teachers and green berets and toll attendants and game wardens and crossing guards and umpires. End quote. Lehner's fictional response to television is less a novel than a piece of witty, erudite, extremely high-quality prose television. Velocity and vividness, the wow, replace the literary hmm of actual development. People flicker in and out. Events are garishly there and then gone and never referred to. There is a brashly irreverent rejection of outmoded concepts like integrated plot or enduring character. Instead, there is a series of dazzlingly creative parodic vignettes designed to appeal to the 45 seconds of near-zen concentration we call the TV attention span. Unifying the vignettes in the absence of plot are moods, antic anxiety, the overstimulated stasis of too many choices and no chooser's manual, irreverent brashness towards televisual reality, and, after the manner of pop films, music videos, dreams, and television programs, recurring key images. Here, exotic drugs, exotic technology, exotic food, exotic bowel dysfunctions. It's no accident that my cousin, my gastroenterologist's central preoccupation is with digestion and elimination. Its mocking challenge to the reader is the same as television's flood of realities and choices. Absorb me. Prove you're consumer enough. Lehner's work, the best image fiction yet, is both amazing and forgettable, wonderful and oddly hollow. I'm finishing up by talking about it at length, because in its masterful reabsorption of the very features TV had absorbed from postmodern lit, it seems, as of now, the ultimate union of US television and fiction. It seems also to limb the qualities of image fiction itself in stark relief. The best stuff the subgenre has produced to date is hilarious, upsetting, sophisticated, and extremely shallow, and just plain doomed by its desire to ridicule a TV culture whose ironic mockery of itself and all outdated value absorbs all ridicule. Lehner's attempt to respond to television via ironic genuflection is all too easily subsumed into the tired televisual ritual of mock worship. Entirely possible that my plangent cries about the impossibility of rebelling against an aura that promotes and attenuates all rebellion says more about my residency inside that aura, my own lack of vision, than it does about any exhaustion of U.S. fiction's possibilities. The next real literary rebels in this country might well emerge as some weird bunch of anti-rebels, born oglers who dare to back away from ironic watching, who have the childish gall to actually endorse single entendre values, who treat old, untrendy human troubles and emotions in U.S. life with reverence and conviction, who eschew self-consciousness and fatigue. These anti-rebels would be outdated, of course, before they even started, too sincere, clearly repressed, backward, quaint, naive, anachronistic. Maybe that'll be the point, why they'll be the next real rebels. Real rebels, as far as I can see, risk things, risk disapproval. The old postmodern insurgents risk the gasp and squeal, Shock, disgust, outrage, censorship, accusations of socialism, anarchism, nihilism. The new rebels might be the ones willing to risk the yawn, the rolled eyes, the cool smile, the nudged ribs, the parody of gifted ironists, the how banal, accusations of sentimentality, melodrama, credulity, willingness to be suckered by a world of lurkers and starers, who fear gaze and ridicule above imprisonment without law. Who knows? Today's most engaged young fiction does seem like some kind of line's end's end. I guess that means we'll all get to draw our own conclusions. Have to. Are you immensely pleased? <laughs>